Mach 3 Gimme Cruise Show on 2, 3, and 4. Cruise Show line 1, actually 1. 6, 3. Mach 3, Gimme Start, line 2. 5 electric. Mach 3. Five electric. Five electric. Five electric. Mach 3, Gimme Start, line 1, and Cruise Show on 7 and 9. Line 1, Cruise Show 7 and 9, Mach 3. Do something. I hate that Super Ops Line 3 Red Ball Avionics. Super Ops. Line 7 is code 3 for light in the gear handle. Fuck. Uh, so today I'm, uh, I'm joined by three um, female veterans and I want to talk about their experiences as women in aircraft maintenance. Um, with me I have uh, Aaron Larned, who was my OIC at Holloman Air Force Base. Um, I also am joined by Melody Monroe, who we worked together at Luke Air Force Base um, as expediters and uh, section chiefs. And again, we worked together at Holloman um, and ended up retiring. Um, when I retired, she was one of the few people that was I was a supervisor to. Um, and then Ashley Grugan, she's joining us. She runs the, what's the name of your page again, Ashley? The Diary of a Mixed Woman. Right, and uh, Ashley uh, was in the Air Force for nine years, worked F-16 maintenance at Shaw Air Force Base and Aviano Air Force Base. So the purpose of today's discussion is to talk about their experiences in aircraft maintenance and what I, as a male maintainer, may not have perceived, might have misunderstood, or, or things that I saw as well. Um, so first, I want to thank you guys for joining us um, tonight. Um, I guess we'll start with um, Melody. What was your first week on the flight line like? <laughs> My first week on the flight line was very, I can't even explain it. So getting on, let's go with getting on the truck. I think I got on the truck and it was maybe like, let's say, Ask Cap Tuesday. And mm. I was taken aback by the things that go on on the truck because I came from a very limited world. A lot of people would even say I was uh, sheltered before I came into Air Force. And so then coming into aircraft maintenance was a whole nother eye opening experience. That was my introduction to the flight line, the truck. They were like, just go get on the truck. They'll tell you what to do from there. And they called the five truck over to the ECP because I started out in the 308 as well, Chris. And they pulled the five, the old the old 308 and pulled the five truck around, hopped on, and it was introduction to the flight line. Actually. Sorry, I put myself on mute when other people are talking. Um, my first day at the AMU so this is why I asked you before about the sexual harassment piece because <laughs> my my supervisor when he picked me up from the airport at Aviano told me in front of my now ex-husband that he did not want to have a female troop and then he took me around to the AMU and uh, everyone started talking shit about me instantly and then my first day on the flight line um, somebody made comments because my hair, I had my hair straight that day and my hair fell out while I was launching a jet for the first time. And my ex came up and was like cussing at me. What the fuck is wrong with you? Can't launch a jet like that. Da, da, da. I had no idea that my hair fell out. Cause I, you know, I'm wearing headset. I'm in uniform. I didn't know that my ponytail was like slipping. Um, so that was my, my first time on the flight line. Hmm. So, Aaron, you were an officer, so it's hard to say your first time on the flight line, but I guess what was your first experience in aircraft maintenance? Um, I think I generally just got introduced to a lot of the different sections kind of at the beginning. So I started off in the back shops on heavies and just got told I was going to be in charge of a particular section and then toward each one and spent time with each one for a little bit. But it so, was weird because my office was completely separate from where everyone else was. So I was an accessories flight. So fuels and E&E &E and hydro were all over. 
Mm. And then our office was completely segregated. So it was just me and two master sergeants in one office. And it just seemed very detached mm. from where everybody else was. So um, I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna cut to the chase and talk about when me and Melody uh, first met. Perfect. I can't wait. <laughs> so I'm intrigued. Um, and I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna. You know, ask ask a few questions because I'm interested in Melody's opinion here. So when me and Melody met, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I was a swing shift expediter in the 308 and i think you had just got plugged into the truck on either day shift or swing shift right um and um as i've i'm, I'm if anybody's read stuff or or anything they know that I, me in production kind of brings out the evil in me a little bit the devil. Let's, let's the devil right so <laughs> that, but okay so i have no doubt that at some point during our or, and it wasn't even that long. I think we only expedited together like four or five months or something. It wasn't because I was only in the truck for a year total. Um, and I would not be surprised if sometime in that in that limited time that me and Melody worked together as expediters that she did not wish I would die of uh, a horrible ailment at some point. And that's not an assassination of Melody's character. That is that is my perception of how horrible my behavior was towards Melody that I would expect that type of response. So it, since then, uh, we get along very good. Um, and, you know, she relied on me as a supervisor and I did my best to take care of her towards the end. And we correspond every once in a while talking about things in the military or job opportunities or stuff like that. Um, I consider her to be a dear friend. Um, but I'm not sure if she could have ever foreseen our current relationship no. <laughs> with our relationship when we were expediters. Now, here's my question. Probably, I would imagine that looking back now, you probably understand that my behavior was much more a symptom of me in production and not me as a person. But at the time, I wonder if my, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of call myself out, I was definitely abusive to a lot of people, you included, and I wonder if the, if what I, of how I acted, if you ever perceived it that I was, I was acting that way because you were a woman or because I was a misogynist, and I'm interested in what you think. I thought it was, no, I just thought you were a total asshole at first, like not necessarily <laughs> that I was just a woman, it was, you're right, I think you were on swing shift and I was on day shift and you would expect certain things to be done. But it's like, you know how when you get on the truck and you start exercising, they just throw you in the truck. It's yes. not like anybody ever really trains you on how to do what you're supposed to do as a driver. And so him being an experienced driver and me being the newbie, it was five, what do you want? Five, this, what's the status of this aircraft? What's going on here? What it, and, and I was just like, I don't know what am I supposed to be doing. It was like day one, week one. He was in my ass all the time. And I was like, he is an asshole. It was him and in the day shift three driver. They were both in my ass all the time. Instead of like, you know, instructing me on how to do X, Y, Z or telling someone how to do something or you should be looking out for this or, you know, make sure your people are doing this. It was none of that. It was just like, jump to the point and the quick of the matter, you know, and fuck your feelings and this is what I want done and do it right now. And it was absolutely hellacious every day that I was on the flight line with those two expediters. It was ridiculous. And I'm pretty sure both of those expediters, Chris and then the other day shift expediter, and then they swapped when one went to swings and the other one, Chris came to days. And we individually, we both had knocked down drag out arguments right in the break room. I'm talking about where the chief was like, take your ass yeah. in your office. I don't want to hear it. And he didn't say that we were fighting. He just was like, take your ass out of the office in front of these airmen. Yep. That's awesome. <laughs> and, you know, and, and again, I'm not trying to make excuses, but for me, I might be good at my job in production, but what it does to me as a person makes me 
a terrible fucking person is really what the reality is. Um, so a lot of the frustrations I had with being under resourced, being under, you know, not enough experience, not enough people, not enough time that a lot of that was, you know, in, in aircraft maintenance, you eventually you're ch you're chasing hundred percent efficiency because you're so resource constricted. So my expectations for my five driver was perfection because I needed perfection in order to, but I digress. So I just really wanted to kind of explore that because I, kn I knew that I was um, not healthy and I was abusive, but I, w I was interested in if you thought it was a universally um, unfavorable trait I had or if it was because of some sort of sexism. And I'm, you know, yeah. at least I was a jerk to everyone uniformly and it wasn't yeah. necessarily targeted. Um, but I guess that brings me to the question, have you ever been has there ever been overt sexism in any of in any of you guys's experience yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what happened i just i, I feel like uh, so uh, what i meant to say earlier was um uh, that you know i felt it was more discrimination than harassment but being on the truck and listening to the way that people would talk about how they thought women should be on the flight line and uh, that, the, you know, basically what it came down to was they all thought that we were about tits and ass yeah. and that we, you know, we couldn't carry our own weight and stuff like that. And, you know, just if you wore makeup, it was because you were trying to get attention, you know, all that kind of shit. And then what pissed me off at Aviano specifically is <clears throat> the AMU is very far away from the loop that we had. Mm -hmm. And so if you didn't get on the truck, you had to, to walk and it's quite a hike and you're going up and down the stairs and, or up and down a hill. And we didn't have push boxes. We had carry boxes. So you had to carry a launch kit and you had to carry your, your toolbox that had all the, you know, obviously much heavier, had all the tools in it. And uh, if you struggled even a little bit, they would talk shit about you. And I'm just like, this is a you are struggling. This is a heavy ass box. Why do you feel the need to? To say something to me about it or if I needed help you know we didn't have like a, a a wheel and tire kit that was all together like at Shaw when I saw that they had a push box that had everything that you need to change a tire and I was like oh my god this is everything like it has the jack it has like everything that you need to change tire but at Aviano everything is separate you have to check it out separately and if you don't have if you don't get into the truck or if they you know leave you at support you're screwed and you have to carry all this shit out and if I ask for help, you know, they give me shit for it. They're like, why can't you carry all your stuff? I'm like, you, like, you're doing the same thing. Like you, other people are helping you carry your shit. Why do, why is it a problem if I'm doing it? So, so how often do you think that you would not ask for help because you didn't want to deal with the backlash of being a woman asking for help? All the time. All the time. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Especially yeah. just starting out when you're learning about your job and learning how to do different procedures out on the aircraft because like my first base was Luke and then so at the time when I came in there were these two senior airmen in our flight they were like you know I don't know if they're the old school probably like how Chris McGee was as a senior airman the old school hardcore senior airmen that were in your ass they, they were your trainers they taught you how to go out and they do things and they were like in your ass for no reason whatsoever. So I remember one day we were, um, it was one evening we were on swing shift and this one of them was working with me and he had been an asshole all evening. So we were opening 1305 and the speed handle slipped and jabbed him in the nose. And I was like, oh, thank God somebody's looking out for me. I wasn't happy. I wasn't, you know, he ran off to go run inside the building to take care of his injury. I didn't help him whatsoever. I just kept on doing 1305. Like, that's what your ass gets from yeah. being a dumbass and an asshole all the time. Yeah. But, yeah, you, you never ask for help. You just do what you're supposed to do. Read the T.O., and you know hope it all comes out right yeah learned that very early on after like your first week on the line just if if it's not like a three-man job don't ask yeah so there was when i was at luke towards the end of my time at luke there was a officer um who was a man and he it was there was somehow the default belief that he was like a mechanical he was mechanically smart inclined or something um, like it was the default 
And then I would sit in at the group meetings and I was like, oh, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. He's literally reading the script that his pro super gave him. And if you ask one probing question, the script is now shot and he doesn't actually have the substance underneath to support what he's saying. Um, I can kind of see it as somebody that had been doing it at the time for 15 years, but I think a lot of people didn't. Um, but there were some female officers that were very much sidelined because almost the default for them was they assumed that they didn't have a mechanical aptitude or an understanding of the intricacies of maintenance. Whereas this guy, like me, I knew some of these female officers and I, and I read this guy at the meeting and I went, okay, he doesn't actually know what the fuck he's talking about. And I've worked with these female officers and I know for a fact they do. And I was really perplexed how the narrative was the guy knew what he was talking about and the women didn't know what they were talking about. Did you ever run into that situation, Aaron, where you as a woman was assumed that you didn't have, I mean, you started nodding when I was telling the story. Oh, absolutely. I think that's the default, at least on the officer side, from both both directions, right? So I think it's from those within your EMU and how they talk to you or what they think you need to know and what they filter and how they talk. And then also the assumption then from the squadron or the group about your capabilities or your ability to accurately give information like you have to prove that yeah everyone has to prove it and for the most part i had really really awesome squadron leadership thankfully and so i don't think i felt so much from them per se that i had to everybody had to prove it you know male or female from right. a young officer perspective but i don't necessarily think that was true from group leadership or from ops either so kind of on the same subject um i you know when i became a senior nco for, for whatever reason i kind of became a, a duck to water when it came to like growing young officers and, and trying to teach them what i knew and what i kind of experienced and explain things um, and I, I, you know, I did my utmost not to condescend ever because I was really enthusiastic about this is how this works. Let me explain it to you. Um, and I really took that as that's my way of paying it forward into the Air Force because these officers are going to go on and do great things. Did you ever experience senior NCO, male senior NCOs that would, you know, that were disrespectful or condescend or kind of treat you like Absolutely. crap? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and again, thankfully I had people like you, and then even, you know, when I was at Nellis, there were other senior NCOs that you very quickly figure out who's going to help you figure things out and who's going to allow you to be part of the team yeah, as yeah. opposed to just treating you as somebody to deal with, yeah. you know? And I think that there was one instance specifically where I finally figured out this individual that I was dealing with just didn't like it when I asked him questions. And I would ask him a really fucking good question and he'd be pissy and he wouldn't respond, nothing. And then the next day, it was a completely 180 degree answer that essentially was my question, <laughs> but then never discussed with me why that switch happened or what changed the vector or any of those things and just kind of realized, oh, I just have to ask you this question twice. I have to ask you the first time, you're gonna be pissy with me. I'll wait a day or two and then figure out to ask it again and then we'll figure out where to go from here. So I kind of managed that particular situation and I'm assuming he just didn't like a woman questioning him in general. You know, that's interesting because going back to Ashley talking about her first supervisor saying he just didn't want to supervise women, you know, I'm making a, lo a leap here, but I imagine it's because the supervisor felt he was ill-equipped to deal with women and their emotions. So what's interesting is what you're describing, Aaron, is you approaching a man with a matter of fact question about some maintenance process or procedure, and then his emotions quickly get in the way of his ability to function within his job. So <laughs> it's, a, it's d definitely... A very interesting uh, sort of scenario when you kind of compare them to Ashley's supervisor's perspective. I mean, I assume that's kind of what your first supervisor was intimating, right, Ashley? Probably. Basically, yeah. They, literally everyone in the AMU thought, like, we had very few females, obviously, it's maintenance. Um, 
I was actually surprised at how many we had in the building overall, but, um, you know, we didn't have very many females. And so they all just thought that we were just emotional and, you know, couldn't, couldn't handle any pressure or, you know, and my dad was a maintainer. He was F-15 crew chief for 22 years. And so I have a mouth just as nasty as theirs. And I don't think that they were ready for that. And, you know, I've got thick skin. I grew up on military installation, but they they all just had this assumption that I couldn't handle the pressure and they, they did the same thing to the other women that I worked with and they they just acted like we, we couldn't handle ourselves in, in whatever way or whatever for whatever reason I, and I can't I'll never really understand that and so that actually brings me to another question I have too is you know we all know the vocabulary of the flight line is rated R slash NC-17 right um, definitely are for sure and you know I used the full spectrum of that vocabulary but there's also a way to use it you know that's that's we'll say appropriate considering your environment and there's a way that is inappropriate um, and I kind of got the impression that I, I, have, I have two theories, and I, I'm interested in, in you guys' uh, opinion on these. Is first, I think a lot of men in maintenance have a hard time differentiating between just regular profanity slash vulgarity and inappropriate sexual comments that are also vulgar. I think they see it as one vocabulary spectrum, and if you're okay with saying shit, fuck, and damn, then you're also okay with, you know, other sexualized conversation that may not necessarily be appropriate. I, I'm, I'm getting some nodding heads from Ashley and Melody. What do you think, Melody? Yeah, so pornography. Uh, <laughs> I've learned about that on the flight line too. I had never been introduced to it whatsoever growing up and learned about it on the flight line in Korea one year. Um, actually stream form of pornography so it was really weird that you know it just popped into that category of conversation we're totally talking about one thing and it rolled right into weird pornography and fetishes so yeah it just it goes it just it just flows from one thing to the next instead of you know hey you know this might not be appropriate while i'm over here maybe i'll talk with this talk about this with the dudes but no you're just like sometimes depending upon who you are you know you just become a part of the group when they're talking about things i won't say it's like that for everybody but from some of my experiences it's been that way ashley oh for sure i i play along with a lot of things so when it came to like porn right like i, I watch porn i'm a human <laughs> we would we would talk about porn but we wouldn't talk about like objectifying people or anything like that like this is gonna sound so weird when I say this. We were TDY and somebody said Google pterodactyl porn. All right. And we, that's interesting. We, <laughs> yeah. So I've never done that, that, but all right. I was really curious why that's a thing. So I Googled it and I instantly laughed. Yeah. Because I thought it was funny, right? Mm -hmm. But then it turned into a completely different conversation where it was like but bitches, women are whores, you know, like yeah. things like that. And I was just like, okay, we can objectively talk about porn. Yep. And, but there's no reason to move into this side. Yep. You know what I mean? Because you can have a conversation about porn without like being discriminatory or sexist or, you know, whatever. You can have a conversation about it. But then it turned into something completely different. And that's when it gets like uncomfortable and it's hard to say, guys, like that's a line because they don't understand that it's a line for whatever reason. And, and, and they're going to, the first thing they say was like, well, you laughed at this, you know, and because they can't distinguish the difference between a, a, an objective conversation about some weird ass porn and, you know, objectifying women and, and saying, you know, sexist things and like, which also brings me to, vulgar. It also brings me to another question. How many times when the conversation moved into something inappropriate, did you not speak up because you didn't want to separate yourself from the team? You didn't want to be seen as the other or a prude or a snitch or an EO or, or whatever that was. How often did you have to, you know, kind of swallow 
not the right words, but accept. <laughs> it wasn't intentional, I swear to God. Yeah, to kind of accept these. these yeah, all right. Let's, let's take a let's take a second and recognize I made a really inappropriate comment, uh, not on purpose. Okay, but you basically had to, you know, accept this type of conversation because you didn't want to, you know, you know, it's almost like you don't want to point out that you're different or that you require special treatment because, you know, when it comes to aircraft maintenance, if you're on the outside of the team looking in, you're just fucked. That's yes. literally what it is. So I, I wonder how many times would you put up with inappropriate comments because the, the cost of fighting or, or, or challenging those comments was higher than you were willing to pay? All the time. Oh. Yeah. All the time. You'd rather just go along with the flow and listen to the bullshit as opposed to stop what's happening or what's being said because you got a job to do. You got, you know, you got to go work with these guys and go do whatever and, you know, throughout the night that you're going to be working. And so you just rather deal with it than, you know, say something about it. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing with being like the discrimination piece. Like, you learn pretty quickly at the, at the, pretty much at the beginning, like what is tolerable to them and what is not. And so you, you don't ask for help and, and you don't speak up. Like after the first time you speak up, you feel, you, you feel that immediate change in the, in the air that you're being ostracized. Now you're no longer on the inside. And so you just, you just deal with it after that. How many times would a male, like the expediter in the truck, tell the other guys to stop with inappropriate comments, behavior. <laughs> when, when did that happen? I don't think I saw that until I got to Shaw. And it was well, probably about two years in the Shaw. At least that's something, because Melody did 20 years and she's shaking her head. I can't say I, that I can personally recall it happening. So, you know, that's where I think a lot of men get tripped up because if they've been making inappropriate comments or jokes or being lewd or whatever, and again, I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that I think a lot of people and a lot of men in maintenance don't, can't recognize the difference between vulgarity, profanity, and inappropriate lewd comments. I think they see it as one big group of, of words and they can't understand it. Um, so what I kind of saw a lot of the times is where, uh, or what I imagine would happen is a lot of, you know, you, you guys kind of put up with a lot of inappropriate comments and then you either reach a saturation point or it's just a fucking terrible day and you just get tired of it. And then you say stop or something. And then all of a sudden they throw it back in your face of we've been doing this for six months and you never say anything before. What the fuck's going on now? Is that, am I, am I imagining the situation close to reality? That's pretty accurate. I think. Yeah, that's why. That, I mean, that's why a lot of people don't speak up about it is because, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll be I'll be the first one to admit it, and um, I've done this on my my videos on my uh, page. I was a part of the culture. I said things that were really fucked up. You know, I I made fun of people that were, and it was fucked up. But even I felt like even I felt like there was a line, even though I was saying like messed up things or agreeing with people about certain things i still felt like okay like this is this is now rape culture that you're doing but because i made these fucked up jokes and i said these fucked up things to other people or or uh, laughed at somebody's messed up joke now i can't I, I didn't feel the room to speak when it came to something that was like okay this is that is rape culture like that's no like no you know because i said so many other things before mm. So I got a question. How many of you, maybe Ashley's experience, or maybe you saw it, Aaron, when you were out on the line, where you have a your expediter, male expediter, and they don't take your opinion on the situation going on with the aircraft to heart, even though you might have seen the situation multiple times across your time in the Air Force. But they didn't take, they're like, you can, you can definitively say that what's happening with that jet is you change X, Y, Z, and it's going to alleviate that problem. But they look at you like, 
you got horns growing out the side of your head because you just suggested a plausible fix and they don't do it. Instead, they go the a whole nother way and with the troubleshooting process where the end result ended up being what you said in the first place. Anybody? You, Ashley? I feel like I talk a lot, so I, I wanted to give you guys room <laughs> to say something. Aaron, maybe? I don't, I didn't have enough experience on the line for that. Oh, okay. That. Then, okay, so yes. <laughs> That happened so, so many times for me. I actually, that was, that was the thing for me where I would stand up for myself and that's when I got, I would get into fights with people. I actually had that problem with my now husband on the flight line. We had a jet that just kept shelling these pumps one after the other after the other and they were following the wrong fault tree. And I told them that and I talked to the supers about it and they were like, if you look at the theory of operation, I was like, that's what I said. And it was like the K strain filter needed to be changed. And so I go back out to the line. I was like, you guys are changing the wrong component and the supers agree. And they're like, well, I want to hear it from super. And I was like, they told me to come out here to tell you this. And you, I, you're, if you look at the fault tree that you're following, that's not even for the problem that like is happening. Like you're looking at the wrong fault tree. It was a whole thing. And then it, it ended up having to be the super had to come out and tell them that. Hmm. But I, oh. there's, you know, I got to the point where, oh, are you going, Aaron? No, I was just saying that's infuriating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I got to the point where I just stopped talking and let them run down the rabbit hole. And then when it comes back around, I was like, hmm, okay. My problem was, is I ended up having to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I was on mids and they were on swings and I had to do it. And I was like, you just shelled out another, another pump for no reason. You know, and that's, you know, you're looking at, I, I'm seeing two completely different reactions to basically a guy blowing off a woman's opinion on, on what the fix is. One reaction is by Ashley saying, no, I'm going to, I'm going to force it because it's, it's, it's causing a lot of work. And then what Melody's saying is I'm tired of trying to explain it and I'll just wait for them to come around to my conclusion. You know, I imagine that Melody is probably not the only, only woman maintainer in the air force that ever said, fuck it. I'm just going to wait and, and let them, you know, struggle with this for a day or two. And then you just, all I can think of is how much time lost, how many hours worked, how many parts, how much money spent because someone didn't want to, like, here's the deal. Melody knows me, every, well, Melody and Aaron both know me really well, know how I troubleshoot and know how I, I certainly how I run impounds. If somebody can explain the theory of operation, why this part is the fix based on the observed behavior, I am not going to give any consideration to their chromosomes or anything like that. Like, if the fix is the fix, that's it. Um, and I've known Melody long enough that she she knows what she's talking about. And if, if I can sit down and have her explain to me why it's a fix, it's going to be go ahead and do it. It just, to me, it, it really bothers me that um, that all the time wasted because people just wouldn't give your input consideration. Welcome to our world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so, like, so for me, like, what's really, what really kind of shows the disparity is everything you're describing is things I never experienced. Like, uh. everything we've talked about so far, I have never had any of these problems at all whatsoever. So now, what I'm imagining is I'm thinking about all the struggles I did have in my career which was a plenty and then adding what you guys are experiencing on top of that. And I was already at my fucking wits end by my 20 year mark, you know? So like if you were to pile on that people just didn't listen to me or, or assume that my questions were stupid and I'd have to ask twice and I'd end up getting the answer I wanted, or I by default didn't know what I was talking about and I would have to constantly prove that I knew what I was talking about. I don't know if I would have made it 20. For me. That's why I got out at nine. It was a struggle to get to twenty. Yeah, that's I right. I, I remember, and you had some asshole expediter that was crawling in your ass too in 2000, uh, 2012. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I will say though, just generally speaking, in maintenance, that was something that we had a problem with. Was the uh, so at, at Aviano, we had a lot of issues with our supers. Um, that, you know, they had their egos and stuff and they just wouldn't listen to the maintainers at all. They wouldn't listen to seven levels in general. And that was 
that was very frustrating because I'll give an example. We, we had a, a jet that had uh, one of the landing gear doors wouldn't close and fly. So obviously IFE comes in, we come in on swing shift and we're like, okay, what have you, what have you guys done already? So at the very beginning of our shift, this, this happened on like first go and they had been working on it for hours. And we asked, they basically, and that's why I asked if you would do something about cowboy troubleshooting I will be. because they wanted to change every hydraulic component in the landing gear. Every single one. They were like, well, change this. We changed it. And when you have, when you do that troubleshooting, you have to swing the gear 40 times each time you change a component. Right. So you can't just change a bunch of them and then swing it 40 times and hope, you know, cause you need to know what, what the problem was. Right. Right. So we had been doing this all night long and we were like, at the beginning of the day when we first started why is not why do we not have any out here troubleshooting i don't understand i don't understand and we kept talking to the supers throughout the night and then we finally finally at the end of the night it was a fucking relay it was a relay so it was an any &E problem from the get-go well it's our 12 hours right and we have to we still have to do forms and shit so we down, we finally get through the swings and we're good to go. And we down jack the jet mid shift shows up with the extra lighter. And they're like, this needs to go back on jacks. The super wants you to swing it again. And we're like, what? We fix it. It's fine. It's good to go. We signed it like forms are done and everything. We just need to go inside and do camp. And we got into an argument with the super. And basically my son level was like, we're not, we're not doing the swing. We'll jack it back up for you if that's what you want to do, but we're not doing the swing because we're out of 12. We have to do cams. We've been here all night. And basically, it came down to the super not wanting to have to explain in the morning meeting why we broke the eight hour fix rate. Oh my goodness. So that's, yeah, okay. So I promise I will do one on, it will end up being an impound troubleshooting one. So if anybody wants to see how I run an impound, you should join, you should watch that one. Um, um, so, oh, God, I got my, my train of thought. I'm sorry. A little bit. No, you're good. It was, it was, I was going to pee back off what you, something you said. Um, ah, doggone it. Well, okay. So I, I did write down something uh, in case I did have a brain fart. So I have that available. So in my experience, the flight line sucks, right? Like we all know the flight line sucks. It's a, it's a rewarding job if you get it right, but it sucks because you're kind of treated terribly. Um, and it seems to me when new people show up, there's, and I don't want to, I don't want to use the word hazing because I don't think hazing is the right word to use. Hazing is almost like a ritualistic abuse just for the sake of abuse. It feels like there's some sort of what I call, I call it callousing where you get a new person in and all the maintainers on shift kind of, you know, abuse them because what they're trying to do is like, it's almost like they have a, 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 their good intentions. They're trying to toughen them up because the flight line, if you're, if you're like a soft person, flight line is just going to absolutely chew you the fuck up and that's going to be the end of it. So there's almost like this ritualistic callousing where a new person shows up. You know, they got like the coveralls that are super clean. The fucking reflective belt is way too high and tight, you know, and, and the boots are like normal and they don't look like they've just burned out after three weeks or whatever it is. Like they get in the truck and then it's, you know, there's a lot of just running them through the ringer of, you know, and then make, make them do lubes or whatever the, you know, put them on, washes for like three weeks straight to kind of just like it's kind of like letting you know that this shit sucks and we need to like make you miserable to callous you over for the suck that's going to like kind of continue um and you know i wonder if if there's any sort if there's almost like a um if it gets tailored to women in, in a certain way to almost set them up to let them know what the environment's going to be like for them. I don't know if you guys have an answer for that. That was just something I was kind of thinking of that I know it happens broadly in maintenance, but I'm, I'm curious of what it, what your perspective is as a woman during that process. They kind of just did it to everyone. Mm -hmm. At, when, when I got to Aviano, they like, if you, all the brand new A1Cs had heaters on the RTV on the kids. <laughs> yeah. 
like everyone that happened to everybody right and then but a problem that I had specifically with hazing or, or, or something along those lines is I was never put on like hard maintenance I was gonna I was actually I had to beg you for that. it yeah that and, and and that's why I loved PFAR because he when I told him I, I had to argue with the the expediters every day I talked to the flight chiefs I talked to my seven levels I talked to my new supervisor that I had later on I wanted to learn maintenance and I and, and when I got put onto like a group thing right I didn't know what I was doing and so they were assholes to me because I, I was like I've never done this before and like, what do you mean and I'm like I've never been put on maintenance I got put on all the lubes you know I, I got really good at doing lubes because I was always doing lubes if there's uh, tanks you know tires stuff like that I always got put on to like the easy regular maintenance shit I never got put on to like heavy stuff and I had to right. beg for it and that that pissed me off because I was like well, what if what what's gonna happen when I become a seven level I, I don't know anything. And you guys are going to trust me to sign off X's? I, I'll clean the shit out of a bay, but I can't, I don't know <laughs> everything I need to do to stuff a freaking motor. <laughs> I got good at that later, by the way, just so you guys know. <laughs> level. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> nice. So when I was um, a seven level um, and I got burned out ish. And I had a line number for tech, so I was like, oh, sweet, I'm going. This was back in uh, 07 or whatever it was. I said, oh, sweet, I'm going to go in the truck. And they're like, actually, everybody made tech, and there's no spots, so you're just going to be crewing a jet as a tech sergeant. I was like, god damn it. That's, that was heart crushing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out there was a job as an instructor, and I applied for it, and I got it. You know, so I know, Ashley, you end up going to a squadron level PTL or you or something and then a melody I know you were an FTD instructor for a little bit did you ever experience kind of I mean did you ever have to consider let me see if I can find the right words for this like as a man I never had to seem like I was a coward or I was avoiding work or I was getting out of doing maintenance when I'm when I became an instructor it was I did X amount of years now I'm gonna do an office job for a little bit then I'm gonna come back out and it was like almost a career progression or a break nobody looked down on me for doing it at all whatsoever is there a, a kind of a culture that if women are trying to get off the line which men do all the time that that it, that is almost a that's what women do oh yeah definitely they can't hack it on the line yeah uh, i'd say like if you see there's always that perception when someone comes off the line for whatever job it is within the squadron that you're just trying to get off the line just to be getting off the line. Not that you're trying to broaden your career and do other things, but it's more looked at as a, she wasn't good anyway. So, you know, go ahead and let her do that. I've definitely heard that from like a supervisor perspective, like heard other females talked about like in that way, people who've worked at the squadron or taken those kinds of jobs, like it's definitely how some folks look at it and talk about it for sure. Yep. And then when they're talking about it, like Aaron says, they're never telling the person, it's always they're talking about yeah. you behind mm -hmm. your back, you know, that you're a piece of shit and you couldn't hack it on the flight line anyway is why that person took that job. Not that, oh, you know, that person might be a good fit there So yep. what about pregnancy? What does that <laughs> what does that do to your career? What does that do to your perceptions? Like that's something I've never had to navigate. I don't have kids, but I, I've heard the, the the comments. So I'm gonna let anybody else that has children speak on it. But I have heard the the nasty comments okay. about women getting pregnant. I would love to hear from Melody and Aaron, but I want to circle back around and hear these comments when they're done. So. <laughs> I want to hear the comments. <laughs> I want to hear the comments too. Well, tell, tell us your story, then we can go back to Ashley. So, yeah. When I was pregnant once during as an instructor, um, during my instructor stint, and then this the first time I was uh, actually at Shaw and ended up as the Toto. So coming back to the line after being a Toto, 
it was, I don't think there was any love lost for me in particular. And if it was, it was never said to me. I'm sure there was shit talk, you know, behind the scenes, but nobody ever said any, anything to me. So when I got done being a Toto, I just went back to um, the flight line after I came back from my maternity leave. And it, it, to me, it seemed like it was all co uh, kosher. But I did have issues after the fact, like say your kid gets sick, I was a single parent and we had this shitty weapons master sergeant as our flight chief at the time. And he'd be like, use your family care plan. And that's, um, <laughs> is not the way to go when you have other avenues or, you know, maybe, you know, I'll just take, I'll just take a day of leave. I had plenty of leave built up, but that wasn't the option he wanted me to use instead of so I could stay home and take care of my kid that I think had a 102 degree fever that particular day. So it's, you know, that was a part of one of my experiences with having a small kid at that time. Erin? I mean, I think being in an office, right, as an officer primarily was a little easier from that standpoint than an enlisted maintainer. My job, didn't significantly change from that standpoint. Um, I did move shortly after having my first. And so it was important to me in my new job to be there and prove myself and, you know, those kinds of things. And so I worked crazy hours with a newborn and that was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can only imagine it being worse on the line where it's more physically demanding than what my job like was obviously more managerial. So it was almost emotionally taxing <laughs> also yeah. rather than just physically. Um, I think though that there's parallels between those kinds of troubles of having a child or pregnancy, not being able to perform whatever job you were, regardless of it being maintenance or anywhere else. Like that's, I think something that women struggle with in general and having to take a break from your career and managing, yeah. you know, those things. Um, so that's just hard. I think some of the improvements the Air Force made with waiting for deployments for a year and those, you know, PT testing later, like there was some, I think, improvement certainly um, with that culturally within the Air Force from higher ups anyway. Right. Um, and then I also think that we had, myself included, I think six or seven pregnant or breastfeeding women in one AMU at the same time. Wow. So like, that's a lot. Trying, trying to find <laughs> like safe places. Yeah. For every, you can only have so many people in debrief, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the deep room has to generally be open like you can't keep closing it to pump and you know that kind of stuff but within that unit I would almost be curious to ask some of them that question where it was more prevalent you know where there were a lot of support in place you know supports in place and systems in place and experiences where you had people pumping and doing their job and they were good at it like it's possible to do. And then what that set for the females after them, you know, and how that hopefully continue to pay it forward. But it's hard because we still, there was, even as an OIC, there was somebody who kept trying to get out, like one woman just kept trying to get out of her job. Mm. You know, so it's like, yeah. you're here and there's five or six other females in the same situation that you're in and I get pregnancies are different for everybody and all of this stuff but the chemicals you work with what jobs you're able to do like those things are generally the same yep. and so there's pushback and this one person's really seeming to try to get out of stuff whereas in other people aren't and everybody's being safe. It's not like somebody's pushing somebody to go on the line when they're pregnant, you know what I mean? Or like work with stuff that could potentially harm their unborn child. Like that's not the kind of stuff that was happening. 
but it's frustrating then as a woman too, like how do you then try to manage that piece of it where somebody does try, like is trying to skate and like, is that stereotypical? Yeah, and it's representing the rest of the women in the unit, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then everybody else who's pregnant is like, what are we doing? Like we're sitting here busting, yeah. trying to get all this stuff done and trying to figure out how to make it happen and everybody sees you skipping out on stuff and not doing your work and you know that kind of thing and now it's just like us too that's an interesting there's so there's there's like two halves of the pregnancy or two halves of the child bearing sort of process there's the pregnancy half where you know no chemicals you know you might be on reduced work certainly off your feet probably just because you know you're growing a person inside you and that takes energy i assume um but then there's the after you give birth if you continue breastfeeding you're still not supposed to be around a lot of the chemicals and you're not going to be doing work and i like on the front half like you don't have a choice to be pre i mean i guess you do have a choice but you know no one blames you for being pregnant on the, on the first half typically i would hope but i'm sure there's people um <laughs> but afterwards when you're bre like breastfeeding is you know i don't know i'm sure i'm preaching to the choir here but breastfeeding is by orders of magnitude better than baby formula like the, what what your body produces is just going to be better for your child um you know i imagine there's like this pressure that you know you are an able-bodied maintainer woman and the only reason you're not on the line working is because you're choosing to breastfeed when there is a viable alternative of you know formula available and it's like I, I would imagine how you're treated or how you're perceived between pregnancy where it's a hands-off, take care of you, this and this and this, to the breastfeeding phase. I, you know, this is probably a failure on my part as a supervisor. Is there a limit? Do you, does anybody know if there's a limit in the Air Force on how long you can breastfeed? I mean, they got an AFI for everything, I would imagine. Thank you. I'm, I'm fairly certain for a while it followed the PT stuff, so you were kind of in that same profile. Right. Um, for at least six months, if not a year, but generally it was a profile oh. you know, that you could be put on for essentially your health, right? So, but yeah. now you know there's a a mandate in the AFI that states you know you ha breastfeeding women have to have a room to breastfeed in, mm -hmm. right? So, Chris, you remember at the 308 there was that women's bathroom. And there was a particular breastfeeding woman who she pumped on sitting on the toilet because there was no room. She didn't go into the conference room. Maybe the conference room was being used. Our debrief window at the 308 had a divider with a, remember Chris, it had a, a, a see-through window there yep. so you couldn't go into debrief um the, all the offices had windows of course i mean the, that had funky blinds of course that you know in amus they were trashed anyway yep. so she that's that was the most private option at the time and she would sit on the toilet and do and breastfeed and it was ridiculous she had to do that but there was no mandate at that time back then to have a specific room to breastfeed in that's messed up. Yeah. So Ashley, tell me about um, these comments. These comments. Yes, I'm here. Okay. First, let me go ahead and say that I think that the discrimination towards anybody that is a single parent in the military is messed up because they do the same thing to guys. And that was one yeah. thing that I, I hated across the spectrum. I think it's really fucked up that they do that to anybody like you just be a human being and uh, slightly empathetic towards somebody whose child is sick. Like what the fuck is wrong? With you? <laughs> the comments. So at Aviana, we had uh, a crew chief get pregnant and people were mad because as soon as she, you know, uh, air force officially became pregnant, right. You know, cause it has to be air force official. You have to go to med group to, for them to verify that you're pregnant. <clears throat> right. So as soon as she got her verification, um, she was off the line and we would be walking out to the line and people would say, you know, I think it's stupid that she can't be on the sideline right now. Da, 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 da. You know, she's just being lazy. She is, she probably got, she got pregnant on purpose, but she can get off the line, stuff like that. And I literally got into an argument with somebody because they were like, well, you know, we're not going to have her, you know, nine months pregnant, you know, with a full belly care and carry boxes and stuff like that. I was like, it's not even about that. I think 
sex ed failed a lot of people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or they just didn't pay attention or something. I don't know. There wasn't. There's some places that don't do it. Right. That yeah. too, possibly. I don't know. I don't know. Cause I got sex ed and I paid attention, but you know, the first trimester is the most important one that, that you're most likely to lose your yeah. child in your first trimester. Right. And so I was trying to explain to them that lifting things that are heavy or being around harsh chemicals. And even if you think about the, the noise on the line, yeah, right, right, this is a small pea sized fetus inside of their body. And I had to explain that to them. And they're like, Oh, that's just bullshit. I was like, I need you to Google <laughs> first trimester. Like, what do you yeah. mean? That's bullshit. You know, I had to, and I was like, I've never even had kids, but I know that stuff. And I was like, so you guys are sitting here talking shit about somebody who got pregnant with her, you know, her fiance and she's excited about it. And you're tearing her down because you think she's doing it to get off of the line. Now, the one thing that also pissed me off is like that situation that you were talking about, Aaron, where you have one person, one female does something like that. And it sets all of us back like 70 years, all of us it affects every single person you got one person that does something like that and now all of a sudden we are all in that category and if we ever try to get pregnant or if we're ever breastfeeding it's going to be oh you're doing this to get off the line but the the comments that i heard about you know women getting pregnant and, and to, to get off of the line or that they were just lazy and you know like why did they would say stuff like why did you even become a maintainer why did you even you know join the military or whatever if that's what you're going to do and so, so that you don't have to do your job. I was like, what makes you think that, that, you know, like that's what they're doing. Like what makes you think that all women can't join the military because they can get pregnant? You know, it was that kind of stuff. And that, that pissed me off. But I would, I wouldn't tolerate that crap. I, I think it, it needed to be checked because I was like, what if I get pregnant? I love being a maintainer. Y'all know that y'all know that I love working out here, but if I got pregnant, I'm not, it's not because I'm trying to get off the line. It's because I'm creating life and I want to. Right. And that's, that's one of the most natural things in the world. So I would, I would try to shut it down if I ever heard those kinds of things. But every single time a female got pregnant, it was always the same shit. It was it, at, at Aviano and at Shaw. Every time a female got pregnant in maintenance, they always talk shit about them. So and it, it was hurtful to, to listen to. So that goes back to what I kind of explained earlier that you guys are describing these experiences that I just literally didn't have my own. I mean, I, you know, I fathered two children. Uh, I was a staff sergeant for the first one and a tech sergeant for the second one. And at no time did, did my child creation bearing raising that never entered my career, it never entered my workplace as far as conversations there was no discussion over it there was no doubt as to my you know my uh, commitment to work and the mission that was that was never ever questioned even though they knew my wife was pregnant at the time so like i mean you know i was working a lot of hours and i was doing my best to support my wife but you know it's 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 just really strange to to listen to you guys' experiences and describing the addition. Like like I said earlier, working the fight line sucks. It sucks even more when you pile on a bunch of shit more than what I experienced, and it sucked. Um, I think you know, and, and um, I kind of talked about it before we started recording, but uh, we had. Um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna do my best to kind of speak for. Her. Uh, but we had an airman that worked for me. Her name was uh, Elena Kovnat, who I'll just call Kovnat the whole time because uh, that's what I'm used to saying. Um, really, there's two pieces I wanted to talk about. First was I remember one day in the summer at Luke, and she had come in. I was sitting out at the break tables. I was her section chief at the time, and she had come in. She walked into the bathroom, and she had thrown up. And she had gone right back out to start working again. And then maybe 15 minutes later, she came in again, looked, looked kind of rough, and then threw up again. And I asked, hey, what's going on? She's like, oh, I don't know. Something's going on. I keep throwing up. And I was like, then you should probably go home. You know, I knew what our manning was that day. I knew, you know, you're talking about vomiting in the summer in Phoenix. Like, these are not, you know, things. And she very much was like, nope. 
Uh, she's like, I got a jet and I got work to do. And, and I'm sure listening to this part of the calculus was she didn't want to have to rebuild her reputation as a maintainer if she had to wave off a day because she felt sick. Never mind the fact that every time she passed in the building, there was a malingering airman sitting in snack bar. Like, Melody, you remember the guy that shot himself in the chest with a twenty-two and then claimed he was deaf from being on the line for a week? Like that guy Thanks. was in that guy was in snack bar and he was trying to last 24 months. So that way he could get partial GI bill benefits. And the whole time Kovnat's like walking back and forth, vomiting and then going back to work. And, you know, from then on, whenever she said she wasn't feeling good and she needed time or she needed, you know, something easy, I was like, well, I've seen what's what you consider a workable condition. So I have to <laughs> face value. Um, and then the second piece is, is um, she went to Korea um, and then she ended up coming to Hallman. Um, she was slotted to go to Faze, and I think she was talking about she didn't know Faze that well, and she was going to come up to Lyon. This was when the line at Holloman was, well, I don't remember the last time it was good, but it was fucking <laughs> awful. Um, and I was like, you will stay in Faze. Don't screw it up. Go over there. Just do work. You're not staying. You're, she would, already said she wasn't making a career. And um, when, her, when her enlistment was up, I was over at the – QA as a product improvement manager, which, you know, as you know, is the most important job in, in aircraft maintenance. And um, she called me up to come over to the unit. Uh, she wanted to say bye, and her mom was there. And her mom um, said, sorry, Miguel, I've heard a lot about you, and I really appreciate all the time you did to help out uh, Elena while she was in the service. I heard about you at Luke, and I was really happy to hear that you were at Holloman when, when she was coming. Um, and it's like, you know, I figured it out sooner than that. But, but like, these are people's daughters. These are people's sisters. These are people's mothers. These are people's wives. And the same people that, like, treat them like they're malingering or they're sluts or they're, you know, lazy or they're incompetent. Like, these are the same people that are keyboard warriors that are like, I'll fucking kill anybody that, you know, I'm going to clean my shotgun when the guy comes over to date my daughter or whatever. It's like, I, I can't, me personally, I can't understand how, how a person can hold in one hand the idea that their daughter is the most precious thing in the world and she's sacred to them. It's so much to, to the point where they would, you know, brandish a firearm at an innocent teenage boy that's just interested in their lovely daughter. And at the same time, go to work and do grab ass and show porn and, kind of create this environment that is the only way I can phrase it is, is hostile. It's, it's just a hostile environment. And like I've said, and I know I'm a broken record. The flight line's a hostile environment. Anyway, there's no fucking reason to pile on top of that environment. And it's just like, I, I just wish, I wish, I wish units were healthier. I wish the culture was healthier. I wish, people would see the women they work with as their sisters, their daughters, or their wives, maybe not their wives, because that might get inappropriate, but you know, <laughs> like women they care about women, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't, I never, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've written extensively about my career. I have some of these videos. I have, I have no fear that there's going to be some woman in my career coming out of the woodwork saying that I had sexually harassed her because he's, he's just treat them, you know, I don't know. Like, like humans? I guess. I mean, it sounds so simplistic, but kind of listening to what was said tonight, it's just, and I, you know, I attribute it to the fact that aircraft maintenance was, is, was male dominated up through the nineties into the 2000. And it's probably, you know, what are you probably looking at? 70, 30 right now in aircraft maintenance, maybe 80, 20 of men versus women. Um, yeah. It's, it's almost insulates, you know, it, it, it almost is set up culturally to protect men from being accountable for how they treat women because there's so few women and the women have to curry the approval of the men in order to be included, which sets them. There's a power differential there. Like that's what it is. And the woman could be smarter or better, but they still have to kind of prove themselves. And then, and then, and then there's, it's a, it's, it's, 
th there's a strategy for a woman to enter, to successfully navigate and enter an aircraft maintenance environment. They have to plan or think about or contemplate secondary effects of them doing something or expressing themselves that there's not a fucking man out there that has to like think about. So yeah. like, I had, an ahead, IC, I had an IC that I worked for who was just one of the most difficult women in general. She was just, um, she was very smart. She asked very good questions. She knew a lot of things, but she was just a very cold person. She was just not friendly. And I had multiple senior NCOs talk about how they disliked her because of that. However, self-identifying that if she were a man, it wouldn't bother them. So it was almost that she wasn't what they expected. Like she wasn't either mothering enough or caring enough or those kinds of things about people within the EMU because she was just kind of cold, right? But that it wouldn't bother them if it was a male. Oh, I see. Like they would expect that essentially, right? But then on the other side, if you're, you know, a young lieutenant who's 22, 23 years old, and is like super bubbly and happy and friendly and wanting to talk to everybody, like you get laughed at and not told any information and not taken seriously, you know, or any of those kinds of things. So then how are you supposed to learn then from that environment? You know, if you're just trying to be friendly and get to know people and ask them questions and all this, then you're not taken seriously either. And so it's yep. just it's like a no win right. situation so much of the time. And that kind of goes into the, you have to like plan and navigate this weird social construct. Like, you know, there, like when, when you were an officer and you're dealing with senior CEOs, there should not have been a fucking power dynamic where you were at a disadvantage over, over the senior NCO. You know what I mean? Like that, to me, that doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense, but you know, you had to basically find a way and, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding the situation. You had to, you had to find a way to get the senior NCO to do the things you wanted him to do while still sparing his ego from having to answer to a woman. Kind of. Yeah, right. I didn't get the information from him. Mm. So it wasn't even that I was had to convince him of something to do. It was that I was asking him about a plan or I was asking him about what was going on and he wouldn't give me an answer. I and I don't necessarily think it was because he didn't know, but maybe it wasn't his original plan or now he had to think about other things or I was questioning his plan and he didn't and he was annoyed by that. You were just like a baby idiot lieutenant type of, yeah. Or just, or a woman. Like, I, but, yeah. I, but it felt more. No, that's I what I like meant. That's like a female. Right? Where it's like a senior NCO who's just trying to, like, just treat every baby officer that way, regardless of right. male or female, right? But this just felt like you just don't like this because I'm a woman. Like, you remember a totally different conversation with a male OIC. I feel like you'd be bros, you'd be hanging out in the pro super office, like chit chatting all the time. Da da da. But like my presence here annoys you or some threatens you something. <laughs> Do you remember when I think it was either I was leaving or you were leaving, and we had a sit down like a feedback session where I gave you my no shit honest <laughs> take. Yes. And if I'm remember, if I'm understanding the vague story you're telling, I specifically told you that your interactions with that particular senior NCO was a failure that I had, that you didn't. Um, I don't want to say correct it, but I I wanted you to take a harder approach. Yes. And then you correct me if I'm wrong, but then you came back several months later when I was in a different squadron and said there were other things going on in that dynamic that you didn't really yes. understand. And, and then also now today with kind of the information I've gained in this it's short span, it may not have been. So when I gave you that feedback that, and I think I, I think I said something to the effect of, I was disappointed that you didn't address it or, or words to that effect essentially. Right. Um, but 
but that's also, you know, I don't, I'm trying to avoid buzzwords that we talked about me not using <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but really that's because I didn't understand the female maintainer experience. Like right. as a man, if someone's, a, if someone's a piece of shit, I, ex I expect to go sit down with them. And then I've, I've created a detailed list of all your behaviors that are subpar <laughs> and why I think it speaks to your poor character. And now I've categorized you in a bin of a piece of shit for which you'll stay until somehow you crawl out of. But when you're talking about, you know, your experience as a, as a, as a female officer, especially when you're talking about that other, you know, OIC that was basically, you know, mean, calloused, uh, you know, not cold, you know, all these descriptors, you probably were much better informed in, of your experiences than, than me on the outside looking in. You had a lot more to consider when dealing with that particular person because there would have been a cost to you of dressing him down or quote unquote correcting the problem that I as a man would have never been able to perceive. So different, completely different base, right? But we had some concerns within our squadron brought up and our squadron commander took the three female lieutenants within the squadron and had us swap AMUs and have a talk with other female maintainers within those AMUs to try to get a gauge, gauge on how things were going. Mm -hmm. There was a particular senior NCO that was identified as being very discriminatory towards females. And I still don't understand why he, he was pulled from the EMU and moved to a different squadron. But under a guise of needing breadth of experience on different aircraft, right? So how does that then affect, you know, the rest of the, the culture then when it's not discussed at least with like senior NCO levels or like officer levels or something. Cause like the female, like we knew what was going on because only because we, I was the one who got all the, <laughs> was given this information. Right. But like, and then, so it just, to go back to your point though, is like in this particular situation, what was, it, what was I going to do knowing the leadership that I had and what the problem was. Like, I don't think I was ever concerned if I was assaulted, mm. if one of my male supervisors or whoever would have been, like, would have protected me and fought for me, right? right. But when you're talking about more subtly, like harassment and discrimination things, like that's a totally different ball game. Like it's so gray and there's so many decisions that go into like, what do I talk about? Who do I talk about it with? Who is sensitive to what? How is this going to impact, you know, their faith in me and my job, right? Or like, yeah. how are they going to treat me differently? Like, I couldn't imagine being put on the same, like, lube, tire change, like, simple stuff and yeah. not being given the chance to learn all of the other things. Like, how would they expect you to ever be a successful maintainer like nice. they are totally screwing you from the beginning you know like and that's like setting you up for failure and they wouldn't set somebody else up like that like yep. that's you know so that is just frustrating <laughs> yeah but then there enter what you just said enters the uh proverbial well some people say that it has gone away where in fact a lot of places it definitely has not the good old boys club where you set your particular rock star maintainers up for whatever awards or on the jobs where that are going to be seen or this that or other whereas other people who are trying to learn they don't get those same opportunities and yeah. you know and then man god this is just really frustrating so when you talk about the good old boy where it's basically the, the favored 
golden boy, right? And they're set up and they're aligned. You know, nobody, I mean, you might get a few male that are like, oh, it's fucking so-and-so and they're, they're set up, they're the golden boy. But what's radically different is, A, I don't necessarily remember that happening to any women. And two, where they were literally lined up for it. And two, I think most women wouldn't want it because there's also the the unspoken or you know hushed tone spoken where any woman that gets an award that the flight chief you know was sexually attracted to them and or there's an inappropriate relationship you know and or they're they're just bad at their eyes and it doesn't have to do with their capabilities and their skill so it's almost like I saw a lot of women almost shun awards and accolades because they didn't want to have to pay the social price of maybe increasing their ostracization from the section or from the, you know, from the shift. Actually, you're nodding your head. Am I on target here? When I got uh, Airman of the Year Award at Aviano, the first thing someone said to me was, you must have been on your knees for a long time. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. awful. Yeah, I worked my ass off to get that award. I ran, basically ran the Booster Club, and I know that's, you know, cheesy to everybody else, but you know, I set up all these major events by myself. Like we, I, I started an annual picnic that we did at the squadron. And so every year after that, it was a new thing and everyone loved it. You know, like we had the pie in the face and stuff like that. I set up the entire thing almost by myself. I, the people that were supposed to like, you know, the, the truck loving people were supposed to go pick up the equipment so that we could set up, you know, certain things. I still had to run all those things and I was still working and I was on mid shift and I was going to school full time. And I was, you know, volunteering as um, Airman Against Drunk Driving, which I actually used to do some of my homework most of the time. But, you know, I did all these different things. I worked my ass off to get that award. And the first thing someone said to me was, you must have been on your on your knees for a long time. And, I, like, I know we make jokes about knee pads and stuff like that. But for, for to say that to anyone when they have worked their ass off to get that is, like, it robs why, would, them. Yeah, it steals, why would I want to do steals... this again? It steals the pride from them. It you know? happened to me again when I made tech the first time. I made tech my first try. No one in my AMU clapped for me. Not a single person. And then someone came into my office and said, it's because I was in an office position, right? Well, to them it was. And I was in an office position. And I made tech my first time. And again, worked my ass off. I was a training monitor and a UFPM and safety. And I was supposed to just do it for the for the, my AMU, but I ended up doing all these changes and things, and I worked for the entire squadron, which is why I ended up at the squadron level a year later. I got a, a really good rating on my EPR because I made shit happen for my AMU and the squadron, and I made tech on my first try, and the first thing someone said to me, no one clapped, you know, during the early, oh, congratulations, everybody. No one clapped not a single person. And then they, someone comes into my office and felt the need to say something to me like that. You must have been, you must be on your knees or, you know, you're spending a lot of time with all these flight chiefs and everything. So you're, you have it. in. And I was like, just because I'm not on the flight line anymore, you don't see what the fuck I'm doing. I, I, I I'm sorry. I'm ranting, but I, the, once they started bringing laptops instead of uh, computers, right. Before that, it was just computers, and I was I was coming in on the weekends. I was working longer hours. I was more stressed out in my office job than I was on the flight line. And I was coming in on the weekend and I'm meeting my chief and everything. Like he would be there, like, "What are you doing here?" Like, I gotta finish the shit that you asked me to do three days ago, or you know, whatever. And you know, making shit happen for a different AMU deployment and all this different stuff that was happening. And I worked really hard for that. And then when we got the laptop, then I started bringing my laptop home. I was working from home during the week and on the weekends. And my husband can tell you that because it had an issue. It was an issue for our marriage. Yeah. Right. And so, and I, I worked so hard for that and nobody congratulated me. And they, and they told me it was because I was on my knees. That's really unfortunate. And I'm sorry that I'm happened. Sorry. It's okay. I mean, no, I made shit happen after that. I feel but, really good about I'm how getting, I left the squadron. So but it's it's such a you know like I have my senior NCO of the year up there. No one accused me of you know sleeping with Colonel Mora. I think you know, 
<laughs> but like that was that never like any of my accolades is never been a question of did I you know circumvent a merit based system with you know and like. I don't know. Th this conversation has given me a pretty good window into the experience, but I think what it really boils down to is there are these paper cuts that women experience in maintenance that reduce their contributions, that reduce them down to a, a, a level of objectification. And it's just like, I don't see how that is conducive to getting the job done. It disincentivizes women to work hard or it might abusively incentivize them to work fucking harder to prove themselves. Uh, but either way, that's not a healthy sort of uh, 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 pattern there. Um, I don't know. It's just, you know, I keep going back to the, all the shit I put up with. I don't know if I could have put up with all the extra shit you guys are talking about. I would have started punching people, I think. You ever come out of the the wheel well and the the door scrape your back? Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> it does suck. Yes. <laughs> Aaron, I have a question for you. Did you, you did I hear you say you were in the heavy world at one point? Mm -hmm. Did you find that your OIC experience was different in the heavy world versus the fighter world, or was it similar? No, it was question. very. It was very similar. Yeah. I think it's just the heavy world and fighter world are just different. Obviously, you know, obviously, like the differences I don't think had anything to do with like being an officer or being a female. They're just different. But even on my deployment with heavies um, was around the time that Don't Ask, Don't Tell got repealed. And there were some really nasty things written in the bathroom about one of our male maintainers, who I, incidentally, I don't think was gay, right. but they just, he was an outsider. People didn't think he, they worked, he worked hard, this and that. So there was stuff written about him in the bathroom of our AMU. Come to find out, from my OIC that there was stuff written about me. And he told me because he didn't want me to find out because I didn't know that he didn't want me to find out. And, he, and they, he asked me if I wanted to know what it was. And I said, absolutely not. But like I, but I asked him, well, so then we had to address it, right? Like, so I didn't, not necessarily even the fact that I know, you know, I know something was written, you know, but I was the lead on mid shift, right? So like at our EMU call, we ha every day, like we have to talk about something and I got super emotional, but it wasn't about me. It was just about like treat people like decent human. Like this doesn't have anything to do with rank. Like yep. this doesn't have anything to do with position. This is just like be a decent human being and respect another human being like that's the bottom line you know and those are the kinds of moments i think too that really boggle my mind i think and i don't know if it's more prevalent in maintenance it certainly seems it sometimes but i'm sure there's other places like culturally right where that's pretty prevalent too Man, I have to agree. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's an Air Force wide problem or, or a military wide problem, but I think it's exacerbated in maintenance for sure. I think so too. Yeah. So I have a question and I don't know if you guys are going to have an answer. And I think this is just a total gray area question, but I want to throw it out there um, because I'm interested in, in what you think of it. Drawing dicks on stuff. <laughs> dicks are funny, man. Okay. Right. But that's like, it's it's like really I don't understand it. <laughs> I will say this: my dad, like I said, was in the military for 22 years, uh, F-15, and he said it was the same thing when he yep. was in. We have a weird obsession with drawing dicks on stuff. But you know, my husband, like in the pilot world, right? Because I'm married to a pilot, right? Like 
they giggle like it, like yeah. and it's everywhere there too. Like it's so, like, I don't know, but I just don't. I understand. can't not laugh. I'm sorry. It's so. <laughs> but but here's the thing. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll at least give my opinion. I'm interested in what you think, and that way anybody watch if anybody's made it this far, they're like, oh fuck this. Um, <laughs> like. Drawing dicks in random places, that's childish and it's funny, and I don't necessarily see it as inappropriate. It's not a huge deal. But, like, I knew that there were uh, – sometimes people would draw dicks on, like, the bottle, like a woman's – a female maintainer's, like, drinking oh. bottle on the spout. So, like, the dick was, like, going in her mouth as she drank. Like, see the see the reactions here, people watching? That's not appropriate. Like, no. there – there's a level where drawing dicks is like fun and it's just a bunch of people being stupid, vulgar people. It goes back to the conversation we had before between vulgar and profane is fine, inappropriate. There's a line there. And when you're like specifically drawing dicks at a particular female person over and over and over, it goes back to the conversation we had before where she may not feel comfortable bringing it up saying, hey, this is a step too far because previously she allowed it because it hadn't gotten to that point. Or she's afraid to bring it up because it's, you know, she doesn't want to be, you know, separated from everybody else. But just like if you can't control where you draw dicks and you don't know if you have the self-awareness to not get in trouble over or not be, you know, create a hostile environment. If you don't have that level of maturity to do immature things at the appropriate times, maybe uh, don't draw dicks. If when in doubt, don't draw dicks. <laughs> At Aviano, they have a Thanks. whole table at a smoke pit on the loop that is, it was purple at one point for the buzzard rule. And uh, it's literally just carvings and drawings of male genitalia everywhere. And that reminds me back when. Um, uh, it's ridiculous. I'm sure, I'm sure probably maybe everybody here was serving at that time. Remember it was around 2012 or 13 where basically they're like the squadron commanders had to go through all yeah. the drawers of every single unit and look for things that were inappropriate. And we got rid of like, we had like a sports illustrated, like it wasn't the swimsuit issue, but it had like in the bottom corner, it had like a little box of the next issue is going to be the swimsuit issue. And it had like a, per a woman in a bikini or something. And they're like, wow, oh, this has got to go. And you know, it's like, if you can't, maintain a healthy environment in your unit you know and it sounds like from talking to you guys that we're not very good at it then they're going to come in and shut everything down because they don't know how to syst systemically differentiate between appropriate and inappropriate so everything goes so like the motivation i would hope for the maintenance culture would be kind of keep your house in order so that way there isn't some stupid shit coming down right uh, we've been talking for like, I don't know, like an hour and 15 minutes. Does anybody want to do, is there anything we didn't address? Because again, I don't, I certainly don't know. Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Period. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I wanted to hear from everybody else because y'all know I got a story, so. <laughs> I don't have any stories on it. Like, really? No. Left when it was time for business and. I personally, like, I feel like people didn't talk necessarily, if any talking was done, it was behind my back. I didn't necessarily catch anything where anybody was untoward at me. So I can't, I don't have any experiences about it. Oh, what? You said, I want to hear your story, though. <laughs> oh, I have so many, though. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, like, and something that I talked to Chris about before when we were so many reasons that I loved Sergeant Farr as an expediter. He doesn't give a shit about making rank. He doesn't give a shit about awards. He's made, he made that clear basically the day that he walked into our AMU. He's and my protege. Cool and shit. What's that? <laughs> He's my protege. Oh, good Flush enough. your career down the toilet and love yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so he and I developed like a code word system because I have endometriosis. So when I'm menstruating, it's really bad. My cramps will make me throw up. There's been one time in my career that I actually had to call into work and say, I can't come in. I've never done that before. I haven't done it again. It was that one time that I had to call my flight chief and tell him I am in a bathtub 
with an entire canister of Epsom salt throwing up, mm. you know, and I was on mids. And so it sucks because everybody knows mids is, you know, your skeleton crew. And, you know, he, he was cool with it. But the next day when I came into work, everyone gave me shit. And mo not everybody understands this, but not every day of your period is the same. You know, sometimes it's really bad. Sometimes it's not. Mine just happened to be really bad the night before. So when I came in the next day, like, I, oh, I thought you were like dying or something. I was like, no, I just had a really bad day on my period. Like, oh, you still want to come into work. And I was like, no, like I have literally been pushing a dash 60 on the loop, throwing up at the same time and just like still pushing so hard to to continue to prove myself and not wanting to like go inside and like like take medicine or, or whatever just so many different things and and if i did that when i did do those things i'm on my period and you know i'm not going into a porta pisser on the flight line just not they're nasty and i got bit by a spider so that's another story <laughs> And, you know, I have to go inside more often to take medicine and to do womanly things. I have to go to the restroom more often when I'm menstrual. And so people gave me shit for that. And I, I hated it. I was like, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> I didn't ask for this to happen to me. I didn't ask to have this happen once a month. And there's nothing I can do about it. But they, they treated me so differently when I was on my period. And then, of course, if you ever get an attitude about something, the first thing they say, oh, you must be on your period. And yeah. I, I've always hated that because it's not fair. We, again, we didn't ask for a menstrual cycle. I don't know many women that would be like, oh, I can't wait for my period unless, you know, there's an accident or something. Right. But, you know, <laughs> so, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I don't, this is, I don't want this pain every month. I can't, but there's nothing I can do to control that. And so when I'm on the line, and I, you know, it's hot, it's muggy, it's humid. I've got stuff going on that I need to take care of. But when I have to do it, it's a problem for everyone else. And it's me trying to get out of my job. Yeah. And I, I, I know, I know other women that experience that. And I just didn't know how it was. Cause I know some women that like, don't feel any pain at all on theirs. Right. My, my, my OIC that I was talking about earlier, she, she was like, I've never had a period like that before. I would literally be in the bathroom crying like in pain yeah. and nobody just they just talk shit about me it's messed up and i was like she might have um she it made me want to ask you earlier when you said um one woman can set you back like you know so many years the whole women in maintenance back so i've had the experience where say you know you're out there humping on the flight line you're carrying your toolbox you're you know even if it's like a big heavy maintenance box and you either got to push it out or put it on the wind wagon and get out to the end of your row but then you have say a extremely beautiful woman that comes into your flight that gets catered to yeah. well i'll put it that way Whereas they're like, hey, I'll carry your toolbox. I'll do this. Don't worry about that. I'll go check out what you just meet me out on the jet. So that's really frustrating, too, because you have like like Ashley was saying, it just sets the whole thing back. And then you're still in the flight with the same person where you got on one hand, you're out there humping to do what you need to do for your job. But then you have person A that just came in the flight that you know, all the guys are, you know, falling over trying to get in their pants, basically. I would like to touch on that also with the, um, the stalking that they do when they find out that there's a female coming in. Go ahead. And I'll tell a story because I'm guilty of it too, but go ahead. Yeah. So when I got to Aviano and at Shaw, they, you know, they looked me up on Facebook and they, they pretty much auto judge you. Like what kind of person you're going to be when you get to the base? Like, are, are you going to be a slut? Is she going to be a bitch? Is she going to be a whore? You know, like what pick one. And so I'm not ugly. I don't think. <laughs> so when I got there, you know, the, one of the first things that somebody said to me, I was sitting in the break room waiting for uh, someone to give, uh, take me to um, maintenance. So, Cause I, I didn't know the, I didn't know the base. Right. So I was waiting for my flight chief to take me to the MPS building. And this guy comes in and he was like, I didn't you know, he was weapons or whatever. And he was like, what are you doing in here? And I was like, waiting for a ride. What's up? And he was like, well, you know, like you're, you're really pretty. Like, why are you in this building? And I was like, I work here. <laughs> like what? 
<laughs> I was so confused by that. I was like, there's other women in this building that are, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone's ugly, but I was just like, what kind of question is that? And then seeing it when other women were coming in to the unit and I, I'm a bisexual woman or woman. So I, you know, I think women are attractive, but I was never like, Oh, like look at this new piece of meat or anything like that. Like they would literally be gathered around the, like the, in the cams room, looking at the computer screen on government computers, stalking someone on Facebook and, and trying to go through all their profile pictures to see if they can find them wearing something risque. I just, I think it's like disgusting that they do that. And I, I hope that it's gotten better and people don't do it anymore. But, and, and then if you're a snitch, or if you've ever had an EO complaint or anything like that, you're losing base. We'll call your gaining base and tell them that, you know, you got a snitch coming or whatever. Like it's horrible culture that we have. <laughs> I don't know if it happens outside of maintenance, but I know for sure it happens in maintenance. So I have a story similar to that where I was the bad guy in the story, but I'm going to tell you because that's the point of these discussions, right? So in 1999, before there was like social media, we had an inbound to the three tenths. Uh, her name was Shannon Galloway, and I was like, and I was single at the time, and I was like, we're getting Shannon in. Shannon's a pretty, that's a pretty name, so she's gonna be pretty. And Shannon in process, and Shannon was a six foot five, two hundred and sixty pound guy from Tennessee, named Shannon Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first and last time that I eagerly anticipated a woman coming into the section. So <laughs> that was my immediate karmic moment right there. So <laughs> I got mine. That's funny. Right. Definitely funny. How, do you guys, did you do Melody and Aaron? Did you guys not see that or experience it or hear about it? Oh, yeah. I saw it all the time. And, you know, I was avionic, so you get, at that time, you know, back then, now it's kind of, you get a mix of females, I think, in every flight, but it seemed like when I first came in, most of the females came in either E&E &E or avionics. There was a few dots in crew chiefs, a few dots and weapons, but they were mostly avionics. And so you always hear it like, oh, I wonder what this person is going to be like. And then, you know, I'm in the same you know, age range is Chris. So I came in, you know, in 98, 99, where, you know, Facebook wasn't an option. So people were going off of the name, like, ooh, Alyssa sounds like a nice name. I bet she's pretty or, and things of that nature. But then as time progressed, when Facebook became something, you would hear the guys in there when the inbound roster would come in and they'd pick the females out coming into your flight and they would actively be on Facebook looking to see what this seeing what this person looks like or if she's a quote-unquote dog or if she's hot or this that and the other so yeah i've seen it yeah aaron you didn't see anything like that not i don't think it was something i was aware of i think there was certainly like comments amongst like regarding female officers certainly mm -hmm. like from other male officers were things I heard more of, but I don't think it was as prevalent. I mean, they're just not as many, right? Yeah. So from that standpoint, but no, that's mm -hmm. like, what do you do? Like, you just, like, you can't do anything really, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's part of what's frustrating is like how, cause even like going back to my deployment thing, I told my OIC, I was like, I don't even wear makeup. Like we're deployed. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like, I'm just here, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I'm trying to be friendly or I'm trying to, you know, make sure like it's hot out or it's cold or I want to know how people are doing, like, what can we do? And, you know, it's just like trying to be a good person or a friendly person or whatever. And it's like taken the wrong way or I, I don't know, but yeah, what do you do? Like, yeah, you filter everything on your Facebook. Like that's not realistic or fair. Really, either, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I've written a lot over the last um, year, especially, um, where I've moved from stories in my career more into like Air Force wide issues. Um, 
So, like, I truly believe there's a suicide problem in the Air Force. And I also believe that the suicide problem right now is probably being masked by COVID. Basically, COVID came along and allowed the DOD to create a, a, a viable al alternate explanation for a suicide, um, suicides in the military. Um, but, like, you know, some of the, the articles I wrote between the deep dive on uh, suicides lands in the shallow end and, you know, the crisis in aircraft maintenance were really detailed unreasonable expectations by SecDef Mattis on down. Like the the message I, I really wanted to kind of convey in this discussion is maintenance especially is very hard on people, which is why I think you see people go, you know, it's 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 really set up for failure too. Like you feel guilty about going to mental health. You go to mental health and you know, I'm not going to go off on a tangent here, but in my experience, a lot of doctors are more interested in, in symptom mitigation than actually treating and curing people. Um, so it's like, you know, maintenance is kind of grinding people up. And maintenance has been grinding people up at least for the last 10 years or more. Um, people are killing themselves. I'm like, I'm still waiting on uh, the DOD to shit out the by AFSC suicide data um, and from a FOIA request from last July. But I really want, if anybody hopefully made it to this point, I really want you to understand that people are, normal people, regardless of their gender, are killing themselves in maintenance, and maintenance is under-resourced and everybody stretched their wits. But I hope you listen to what the women said today and recognize that if you're a man in maintenance, you probably have not experienced anything that they're experiencing. And if you're at your wits end, I really want you to try to empathize and understand that I would, I would ask that you, you know, do your utmost to make your work center not hostile to women maintainers, women service members, because the reality is it sucks enough. And if a woman kills themselves that, that you supervised, you know, I'm a firm believer. Like, Melody, you know, I was a tyrant. You remember me being a tyrant. I was a tyrant to you, but you weren't the only person. And I, I really am, am thankful to God that no one that worked for me killed themselves because today I would not be able to be okay with myself if my behavior contributed to someone killing themselves. Um, so I would just ask that people consider how they treat women in the work center. Treat them, treat them like it's your daughter, unless you're a child molester, and then don't do that. But, you know, treat them like you're, treat, treat them like, <laughs> you know, treat them like it's your daughter. Like, you know, I was talking to Aaron before we started recording. It's like the parents of these women are handing them over to the Air Force, and there's a trust there that their child, yeah, they're 18, 19, 20, or whatever, but they're, that's, they're still, you know, starting life. And there's a trust that the parents have, you know, sheltered and grown this person, and they're handing it over to the Air Force, the United States government, to take care of them. Take care of them like it's your kid. Try to have a parent come up to you and thank you for looking out for their daughter during their service. That should be your goal. Like, yeah, that's all I can say. Like, just try to make it better for them and recognize that it doesn't need to be a hostile environment. Can I say something before we go sure. also? Sorry, I know I talk a lot, guys. I just got so many things. Um, I want to say to the women that are in maintenance, don't tear each other down. I was that person. I made fun of other girls for wearing makeup to work because I got made fun of for wearing makeup to work. I said crude, horrible things to fit in. And it's okay to admit that you are a part of the problem, but you need to make a change. We all do. It's a, it's a group effort. A zero tolerance policy is everyone's responsibility. I know that's probably the most Air Force thing that I could probably say, but it's true. And we, as women, should not be doing those kinds of things to other women. And like I said before, I have admitted to the fact that I have been a part of the problem. It's okay to admit that you've been a part of the problem, but you need to make a fucking change, and it needs to happen now. Sorry. Just one second. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Aaron, Ashley, and Melody for coming. I appreciate uh, you humoring me, asking dumb questions. Um, um, you know, thanks for, you know, trying to make the Air Force a little bit better. <laughs>